Welcome back to ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters, but it's about books. How are authors going to beat AI? This is a very complex question. It, it's not a yes or no question. And of course, the tagline is, uh, is more interesting. And if you can't beat them, why not join them? <laughs> With Chris Trammell, who is uh, an author and a life coach, and he's going to join us and answer that question. It won't be easy. And I can't tell you exactly where this conversation is going to go, but it's going to go far and wide. So, Chris, you posed the question, how are authors going to beat AI? So, is it possible? And how are they going to do it? Yeah, great. Um, thank you so much for having me with you again and for everybody listening in. And I did. After we did our, our last conversation, uh, I'm Chris Trammell. I'm the creator of the Author Launchpad. And we talked about, you know, how are authors going to be able to monetize their books? The next thing that was the obvious follow-up for us, Jay, was then to start to look at this rising tide of artificial intelligence written books, the AI that has now inundated our world. And how does an author, because one of the things that we're going to look at is most authors build the muscles of the introvert. What do I mean by that? They spend hours and hours in their offices, in their quiet places, writing, writing, writing. Now, back in the day when you would have a publisher or an agent that could get your book out there, then the muscle of the introvert or the extrovert didn't matter because the publisher did the work for you. There wasn't an Amazon that was really going to carry and lift for you. The five big publishing houses had the market share. Well, with the internet, we all, if, Jay, do you have a book? Let me ask you that. Do you have a book yet? Yeah, I have books because people keep on giving me books. That's why I have books. <laughs> but you haven't written one yet, right? No. All right, very good. So as we talk about how can an author beat AI, we also want to look at what's the opportunity that an author gets to use AI for. And, you know, you have a genius of collecting other people's information. And by now, you're probably able to see some core themes that you could distill out of all of these conversations that people want to know. What's going to help people solve things? So then you could use AI for those purposes to help you say, you know, I want to write a book about these 10 themes. Tell me how I should structure it. Uh, couple authors that you like. Are there any styles out there, Jay, of books you've written or authors you've seen before of styles you like? Plain language. Plain language. Who's a plain language kind of writer? Uh, that's, well, let's just put it into AI that way. Please give it to me in plain language. Make it clean, make it simple, and now give me my outline. So you can use AI for that purpose. It's the AI that we're talking about now that is going to allow anybody else to generate content, to generate a book and get it to publish because they don't have that deep personal skin in the game that most authors have because they've spent the life experience. They're talking about what has made a difference for them to put into a book. Now it just becomes a transactional, transient, put it in, it gets spit out, Send it up to Fiverr, get someone to put a cover on it, a back end on it, ISBN it, put it up onto Amazon, and now you're selling a book. And you could really have that done, done well with the team in a weekend or less. So why not? Why not do exactly that? Well, you could. But what part of the conversation do we want to focus on? Do we want to talk about supporting the authors that are going to still do the work or the transient transactional work that really doesn't move people forward. I would say you create a think tank because you're interested in moving people forward. You're not interested in putting up crap, for lack of a better term, as content. Let me ask you this, though. Please. You know, to me, what I like to read, what I like to do is I like to go a step further, you know, than... than the common public com conversation. Yeah. I like to have new ideas. I like, I like to think that the thought leaders are the ones who take us to the next part of the evolution of human thought. 
Yeah. And, and and that's been so. I mean, they, yes, they sit in a room and they, they think, maybe they talk to somebody about it. You know, bouncing it off other people has always been beneficial. You, know, you come up with a new idea, you bounce it off someone else. And then, you know, then you have something that goes a step further. Going a step further is really important to me. So if I took every talk show that we had, you know, and there's thousands of them, and I ran it through chat GBG or something like that, and I said, yeah, why don't you, why don't you summarize this in 20,000 words, something like that. Make a book out of it and make an outline out of it. Let's see what you can do, and, I, and I'll take it and I'll, I'll publish it because in there somewhere, there's some value. But that's not necessarily integrating it into a new idea. So it's the new idea that I think is really important. And, and I guess the question that I'd like to ask you is I'm sitting alone in a room using my brain cells to the max and coming up with new ideas about the human condition and trying to, you know, appreciating humanity. Mm. Is that something that, that AI cannot do? If I tell AI, do that. Find some new ideas that take humanity to the next step. Will AI be able to do that? Maybe it will. When I created the author launchpad, one of the things that I saw is that authors were putting in deep personal work about their experiences, that's the humanity, about their education, the humanity of going through some sort of process and journey, and then distilling down what is the lesson, what is the message that I want to deliver. That is all part of humanity. I've got Joseph Campbell's right here, uh, Pathways to Bliss, which is all about our humanity. It's all about that common collective journey. So the nuances, what you're talking about when we talk about our humanity is the nuances of being listened to. Can you see me, Jay Fidel, when I'm speaking? Can you hear my journey, Jay, while I'm speaking? Can you and I create a conversation that all your listeners are able to locate themselves inside of this conversation so they benefit from it? AI doesn't care about that because it doesn't have that type of awareness. But it can create content that our mm, subconscious our ego begins to fill in like a horoscope. Uh, is it talking about me? Maybe this applies to me. Maybe I should listen to a little bit more. Our little brain likes to fill in gaps. So when we talk about the humanity, I always say that it's to be seen, to be heard, to be loved, to be safe, to know we're connected, and to have work. Those are the big ones of humanity. And AI could speak to all those when we assign that. But you know your job as a host is to have people be seen, to have people be heard, to have them know that their time was valuable and so that they could create connection and worth. Well, I, gee, I hope I do that. Um, maybe I should make notes. <laughs> this is very valuable to me. And so, you know, any discussion, that's why I, I think talk shows are so valuable. It's the interchange. You can make a speech, not the same thing. It's the interchange where I say, maybe yes, maybe no. Have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? But, you know, here's, here's the problem. Uh, I agree with you that the essence of, you know, the, the evolution of humanity is not really going to be part of the large language model. It's not. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I can come close with some, some suggestions and some options. You know, the AI is really good on options and maybe connect the dots on the options and I'll have something good like in that book. Um, but, you know, the, the problem is when I go to Amazon, um, how can I distinguish the thought leaders that are taking me to the next chapter, so to speak? Yeah. The thought leaders who are giving me ideas to move the species, the civilization ahead from those that are just using whatever they have in large language models so far. By the way, I have to add, hmm, maybe we will see AI go further, maybe soon. It's an avalanche right now. Yeah. But let's assume that it's, let's assume it doesn't understand the hum humanity aspect. How can I tell the difference between a book that does understand that, that takes me to the new level, 
and the one that doesn't that was written by a machine. Mm. How can you tell the difference? I think that's part of the million dollar question right now, Jay. Uh, let me ask you, do you know uh, Louise Hay? Did you ever hear the name Louise Hay? She was the publishing house for uh, Wayne Dyer, um, Deepak Chopra, uh, a lot of what we began to call personal development and self-help. Uh, Louise Hay was one of the first ones to create that publishing house, which became Hay House. Now, why am I answering by delivering that? The other day, I in my morning routine, before I do the work and start to market the author launch pad and start to work on clients' work, I will listen to some sort of meditation. And I found a Louise Hay meditation. And as I was listening to it, the words, the affirmations, they were really good. But I was like, I don't know this. I haven't heard this content from her before. So I read in the description, and in the description, very subtly, it said, um, the work here has been created by artificial, didn't say artificial intelligence, by electronic voice recognition programs. So if you haven't seen, there are already, and we saw the big fake of, uh, happened in, I think it was Massachusetts where it was Joe Biden's voice that was used and said, hey, don't go out to the primaries. We wouldn't ever want to do that. So now they're using people's voices along with this AI-generated image, and you have these really nice stars in the background and watery brooks, and it created a whole dialogue, a whole affirmation session using Louise Hay's voice and her style of delivery. And it did not share until the very end, but you really had to read in between the lines what it meant that it was all AI generated. So it's almost going back to when we first had these conversations about organic foods versus GMO foods versus farm raised. Like, do we need to start to put those labels out there for the, those that can't discern what is true, not true, what is robot generated artificially intelligence generated versus human generated if that matters to us because our consumer dollars matter i mean look how much companies spend on labeling gmo organic farm raised cage free that matters to us so does this platform does this new age also start to matter to us where we say i won't spend money on the bots i'll only spend money on what it is human generated and authentically certified this is really a complex question you know i was thinking and uh, up to our up to this point in our conversation suppose i went to the latest and greatest iteration of ai and i said look i know you know i could actually say this yeah you know, in in the in the query part i know you know a lot but i want to hear you know your latest thinking and I don't want to hear what anybody else is saying. Don't give me a position that someone else has expressed. Give me a new plan. Give me a new arrangement that somehow connects the dots for everything we know and goes a step further. You could say this. And, and, and I want it in 500 words, if you don't mind, and make it into paragraphs. Make it into three paragraphs. <clears throat> and, and, the, and, said, I, and I want from you creativity. Now, I haven't done this. But I just wonder, just as a matter of curiosity, within the four corners of our conversation, what you get if you ask a, you know, a modern, released yesterday kind of AI program, if you told it, don't give me the same old hash. <laughs> well, you could, Jay, and you could say, I would like a program. How about this? I want to create a course for other beginning host on how to launch their own um, live stream podcast or a live recorded podcast in the style of think tech. I would like for it to cover all these different topics. Please break it up into a 90 day program. That's what I use. Uh, have it have three main phases. I'm going to use my model right there. Have it be a 90 day program, three core phases, and make sure that I'm able to teach people by day 90 how they could be the next Jay Fidel. Now, you know, I'd really be curious to see what they come up with. 
Now, the other part of this is um, we are assuming that moving human knowledge ahead is a worthy adventure, <laughs> and that only humans can do that. And I, I would have to agree that. But there are circumstances, Chris, where we don't really want to, you know, move human knowledge ahead, where we want to appreciate the knowledge we already have. Yeah. So, for example, you know, I can have a legislature with hundreds of people. Now, I can have some moral rules, some ethical rules. Um, I could have a governor. I could have politics galore. Yeah. And I say, look, I want to I wanna have a transit system, to use that, uh, that particular model for this conversation. I want to have a transit system that will be economic, that will be efficient, um, that will use the best technology, uh, and that will serve my urban planning needs. Okay? And I don't care about a lot of creativity. I just want it to happen. Tell me how it can happen. Now, that's, that's not really what we're talking about in terms of, you know, the human expression. It is really integrating all that we already know about transit systems. And I, and I take this in a little, a little box about yay big. It's <laughs> three by three to two, okay? And, and I put it uh, in city hall, and, and I send the mayor away. I send the city council away. I send the state legislature away, and I, and I wait for it to give me a report. I know this will be better. Won't it? I, are you uh, finishing with a question or a statement there? Will it be better? Will it be better? It depends. It depends, Jake. You know, because we know that AI is a search engine, it depends on what it searches and what data and information it gathers. Is it gathering the most relevant current leading edge information that is available, or is it taking information and data that is 7, 10, 15 years old, uh, which has more hits on it, so it's been out there more often, and it's grabbing things that have already been used. Um, as well, it doesn't know the nuances of a community's growth, because sometimes that's, as you go back to the humanity of something, we are able to see the nuances that now the, the data engineers are looking for how to incorporate those into the models. That's one of the things that our mirror neurons evolution has given us is the ability to recognize fake and true, nuanced and obvious. Some people. Very good. Some people. That is absolutely true, Jay. That is absolutely true. That goes along with critical thinking as well. You know, I, I, I stand by my original characterization from years ago, and it's never forget we are all mammals driven by biochemistry. And if you, if you seek from us rationality, it's, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very accurate. It is very, very accurate. And, you know, there's a level of consciousness that we haven't brought into this conversation yet, which AI is not the consciousness the way that we talk about the way we talk about consciousness so the way we look at that maslow's hierarchy of need you know what does that self actualization really look like i don't know that it's not that i don't know i'm asserting ai does not have an interest in your self actualization but i do i want to make sure that i coach I deliver, I create content that has people have access to their highest purpose. That's why I created the Author Launchpad and Launch Your Life's Work. So people could reach that tip of that pyramid that Maslow created for us. But AI is just giving you what's now. It's really, talk about the power of now. It is just writing to the now as it has data. Even though it might write about a program in the future, it isn't grounded in the future. It could write about the future, whereas you and I are grounded in the future. You do what you do, I believe, for the different, for the potential of making a difference in the future. Or you wouldn't have all these people on. I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't believe I couldn't make a difference with people in the future. So we're grounded in what we cause in the future. 
AI is generating in the now a program you're going to implement in the future, but it's not grounded in it. You know, I went to a course, uh, it was actually just a seminar at the University of Hawaii where they brought in mathematicians. Uh, this is like five years ago. And the math, this is before AI. Yeah. We call it BAI, before AI. Uh -huh. Very good. And, and they talked about uh, prediction analysis. They talked about taking any uh, question uh, that could be reduced to mathematical terms and looking at it mathematically in terms of probabilities with everything you said into it. And, uh, and I don't know, I can't answer whether AI is doing prediction analysis now based on what it does know from its large language. Model, yes. Or whether it will be doing it in the future. But it seems to me that part of you know, being a, 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 a predictor is to be able to take that information, not only tell you what's going on, but, but predict mathematically, which we have been doing for a while. No, a stock market, that kind of thing. Um, predict the future in terms of these events. And I suspect, I was saying you know, before that we don't know yet how far it's going to go. We can only really tell you that every day there are new entrants you know, into the field of AI, uh, more powerful than the last ones. It's incredible. It's an avalanche. Um, but um, query whether we are going to go to a place where we can look into the future and see whether a relative, you know, relative confidence that this, but not that, is going to happen and make decisions on the basis of that prediction. What do you think? Well, yes, it's, it's already happening. I just listened to NPR recently about a woman who worked within the agriculture industry. And when she was trying to figure out the shipping lanes, the change in climate, what was the better circulation of crops, she noticed it was all disparate information that wasn't being compiled into one main source that helped with world food order and organization. So she created that model of an AI predictability where it's pulling, okay, the weather is changing here. These types of crops are doing better here. These shipping lines right now are being impacted. How are we going to move food around better? What if there's war in this area? What happens to these food lines? So that's the thing that these, you know, we call it AI. Are they computer models? Are they the data aggregation? Uh, is it the data engineering? However, we're going to label that. That does give us that predictive analysis that is very much part of the scientific method, right? Like now we go test it. We collected the data and the information. Let's go test it. Um, that those models are valuable. But what I want to point to as we were looking at this AI is for the author and for our group of persons who are using it for a different purpose, which is to whether it's to educate is to entertain, is to engage, is to have people look more introspectively about their lives. That is a different use for AI altogether. And it's not going to have that future prediction. It can mimic, it can take, if you, were to, if you and I were to write an AI prompt that said, tell somebody how their life could be uh, dramatically different in 15 years from now, if they did these steps, these actions, and continue to build these habits, these routines, and trusted themselves more, it could do that, but not because it is grounded in the future. It could do it because it knows the words. It's parroting the words right now. I want to talk about words for a minute. You know, words uh, and the First Amendment, words in social psychology that affect our, you know, public opinion and, uh -huh. and the votes of our electorate, those, those words. We're talking about words that make you say those six tests you mentioned a minute ago. Um, you know, you reach me, you touch me, uh, you're finding me where I live, where I breathe, where I, where I aspire to be, whatever I aspire to be, you know, my, 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 my life, my, my goals, my, my, my persona. You know? um, so in preparation for this discussion, I went on my phone. This is my phone. This is not my computer. And I said, write me a sonnet. And instantaneously, it wrote me a sonnet with beautiful words. Well, I would read it to you now, but I, I'd rather not because um, I have more to say. And then I said, well, you know, my wife and I, we get along. 
So write a sonnet to my wife. Uh huh. Okay. And it wrote a beautiful, I told it my wife's name and I think uh, it wrote a beautiful sonnet to my wife. Said, We're going somewhere. I'm going to read it to her, telling you, and see what kind of reaction she gets. She knows I can't write this way, but maybe she thinks that I, I sat in a room alone and, you know, and made words that, that, that reach her. Maybe. Yeah. Then I said, then I said, I, I want a story. A story you could use, you know, to, to sell to Amazon and to the public. A story you could use to make a movie. Because a lot of movies now, I mean, I have a program that's not really expensive that can make an interactive avatar. You say something to him or her, and it talks back to you because you program what, what the parameters are. It's amazing. Right now, today. Um, anyway, so I said, to the, I said to my phone, I said, write me a 500-word story that has never been heard before okay and instantaneously it did and it was a really touching story it was about a a woman who was the the daughter of a lighthouse keeper and and she and she maintained the lighthouse and she saved the ships out there in, in you know the and the and the toss of the ocean and one day the lighthouse went out and she remembered what her father said to her he said you know when when modern technology doesn't work, go back. Go back to what you were doing before, the tried and the true. And this is all 500 words. And then uh, she said, well, hey, suppose I get an old lantern and I step up to the top of the White, of the White House and I flash it and I will save the ships at sea, which she did. And, and she thus proved her relationship with her father and with technology and with the ships at sea and saving people and so forth. All in 500 words, written wonderfully, a story I had never heard before, a story that carried a meaning of value to me. And this is happening now. Yeah. And, and that, that's before we ever get to the question of what can you do on social media? You're talking to 330 million people. Right. Well, your thoughts about creating fiction. Yeah. Well, before we go fiction, I think fiction is valuable. Absolutely. You, you it allows us to have an element of escapism. It allows us to have an element of uh, detachment from the life that we exist in, right? That's entertain us. It's um, just to going to watch movies, wherever that fiction is. Now, some great fiction, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, um, The Hobbit, Tolkien, those are the types of fiction that actually has life lessons in it that's what i am interested in and even the one that you had there had a life lesson in it and earlier on you talked about integration why i created the author launchpad the way i did is there's a lot of information out there now we are gluttoned with information people now pay for implementation help me put it into my life there's so many different ways. Can you please show me the ways of putting it into my life? Implementation. And then the next opportunity becomes, how do I actually embody it? How does this become part of my fabric of who I am? Which is the integration that people are really looking for. And it goes back to that humanity piece, Jay. So yes, fiction, nonfiction is great information. The opportunity is, can we move people from the ahas and the abstractness and the inspiration into a place of implementation to action? Because that is what changes the world. That is what changes how people think, their behaviors, their routines, their habits. And then once they embody it, a whole new person, a whole new way of being is generated. And that's where we get to get the integration and that's how we start to move societies and we move communities that way. It's about words. Now, Shakespeare said, to, referring to lawyers, of which I am, uh, he said, um, what are we but merchants of words? Okay? And, and, and now I think, uh, you know, here in the 21st century, what are we all but merchants of words? You're certainly a merchant of words. Uh, and, and I think that we all have to be, and most of us are, very careful about choice of words, because we know that words have power. So here we have uh, Vladimir Putin, a, a master of propaganda, a past master, a life, a life, he should get the award for being a lifetime master of propaganda. And, you know, as in, intrinsically in propaganda are misstatements and 
uh, you know, disinformation. And so, yeah. <clears throat> so if I look at if I look at democracy, if I look at um, you know political persuasion, electing, changing public opinion, changing the opinion of voters and potential voters, those words can have a huge effect, either pro or con. If I want to defend my position, like Joe Biden, you know, I have to I have to speak that message in persuasive language. If I want to do misinformation and disinformation like Putin or uh, Donald Trump, uh, then I use different words for a, a different different purpose. You know, it's a battle, if you will, of words. It's a battle of using words that correctly represent um, what is happening, what we want, and not. And AI, okay, applied to social media, to political speeches, to uh, social psychology in a given society, all powerful, all powerful. And if I can get control of the media and thus put my words on there, I can change the world. Um, and that's a positive, but it's also a negative. Your thoughts? Well, I think you're spot on with it. It's, it's very Star Wars-like. Thank you for saying that. It's the force is the force. Whether you're using it for the good, the Obi-Wan, the Luke Skywalkers, or the Yoda, or you're the Darth Vader, the Sis, the Emperor, the force is always the force. Who is using it and for what agenda, for what outcome, right? And so when we don't like it, we call it propaganda. When we do like it, we call it truth. Um, we, we align to it a little bit more. And I think that is where you have the skill set of a critical thinking individual. And that's what's missing out there because we don't, we'll hear something so out of left field, but because it's inside of our camp that we have to believe it, we embody it and say, oh, that, that must be true. And it's as, I'm trying to be polite, but it's as wacky sometimes. It is as, as so out there sometimes as I've ever heard, but yet people buy into it. So I say it's not the megaphone. It's who's using the megaphone, Jay. And, you know, whoever uses that megaphone, if they have belief in what they're saying, if they got passion about what they're saying, and they actually tend to show I've got a solution for the pain you're feeling, people buy in. You know, last night I took my wife out to dinner and there's a good asking. I am a good guy, but she's the one who asked me to come out with her uh, in any of that. <laughs> so we're getting into a conversation and she's. You know, COVID has had a positive effect. She reads more and learns more, and she's really up on current events. Uh -huh. So she asked me a question. I gave her an answer, and she says, "Have you fact checked that?" Because you know, I don't, I don't believe anything that my intuition tells me might not be might not be right unless I fact checked. And I very good. Well. And she's good. Uh, I haven't, I haven't done that. Uh, she says you have to fact check that kind of yes. Thing. And so the question is, um, is, there a, is there a place to do that? You know, they, they have a, a, on various uh, news channels that say, we're going to fact check whatever this guy says or that guy says, so that we can tell you whether that's true or not. And I think that technology ought to be available to everybody. I don't know if there's a place for you to go to fact check everything. But A, I think there should be. And B, I think if I'm an author, nonfiction or fiction, I would like to have that available to me before I finish my draft, not after. Yes, very good. There is a site called Snopes, S-N-O-P-E-S dot -E com. It's been around long before AI came on the scene because you would often see these wild stories come out and Snopes.com would say, no, that's not true. Or yes, this is true. And the same thing as a, I was a teacher for 15 years. And so... Whenever a student wrote something, turned something into me, if they didn't have a footnote or they didn't have their bibliography or references cited, I would tell one of my TAs, I would circle and be like, Google search this line and see if you could find it. So if people could say, look, I am borrowing this and it's references cited. It is part of my bibliography. Okay, great. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're trained to do. When you plagiarize it, or you contort it and you twist it, then that's when you get 
non-critical thinkers to buy into something that is inaccurate and potentially harmful. And it goes back to that conversation about, you know, the, the disinformation. And we really learned something during the 2020 elections where look how much hands Russia had in it. And they saw the process. And we were, you know, Jay, you're in Hawaii, and I hate to use the same analogy. Um, Pearl Harbor, when we look back at what happened in Pearl Harbor, they always said, well, one, there was a sense of arrogance that they would ever put the Pacific fleet all in one location. And two, uh, we were left vulnerable. And we didn't know we were vulnerable until after the fact. Well, 2020, same thing. We were left vulnerable. There was an arrogance about, hey, we could never be attacked this way. So we keep learning on our heels rather than proactive and listening to those because you and I are just two individuals who have a level of competency in this, but there's experts that could say, here's where you got to watch for this. Here's where you got to watch for this. This is what you should start to get rid of. And, you know, I, I want to stay inside of the lanes for authors, but it's going to go to this first amendment. As you talked about, what is free speech? Well, if it's not yours and it's not accurate, is it still information? Is it still speech that we want to say, yes, that's what the founding fathers were intending? And I don't believe it is. You know, and I was thinking, uh, you know, I, I really like to have a show just like this where we come up with ideas and thoughts we never had before, which I think is what we're doing. Um, but suppose I took an, uh, a, a bunch of mm, questions and I asked uh, AI to write me 500 words on that. Yeah. And a report, you know, a report for the news. That report. Okay, good. Now I have my 500 words. I go to a second AI site and they say, here's 500 words. Can you tell me if there's anything in here that is A, not true, B, that is, uh, you know, a, a, a violation of somebody else's intellectual property, and C, whether there's a logic problem. Am I jumping, you know, from one member of the, uh, of the logic, the syllogism to another? Um, without good cause, and report to me on how good this is and what suggestions you would make uh, to improve it. Now, I believe, maybe not all the AI sites, but I believe that some of the AI sites could do this. I also think that somebody really smart is going to come up with a site that does exactly that. You know, is it, is it, is it, is it true? Is it, is it uh, a copyright violation? And is it logical? Um, you know, within the context of the, the discussion. And, and I would use that. I think that would be really, really popular uh, for any writer, for any thinker, for anybody who, who, who enjoys critical thinking. It's a critical thinking site. Um, somebody that exists. Do that. It does. So tell me. It does exist. If you and you could put sections back into ChatGPT and ask it, did you write this? And it'll tell you, yes or no, or a certain percentage of it. And then there are other sites because that's what Amazon's using. And that's, um, I don't know who else, I don't want to misspeak, but I believe, uh, you know, some of the other ones are Book Baby and um, uh, Lulu. They have the uh, AI to look for AI, to look for the fakes, because they know that to keep their credibility up so that you're just not flooding the system, they have to have ways of being able to intercept and to remove the fakes. Yeah, so you, you, the writer, can call up those sites, find out what's wrong with your written work, and fix it. Or, or you could have another site that fixes it automatically. Fix the problems, you know? Give me, give me some copy that really works. But I want to go to, I want to, go to the original question that you posed here. Yeah. Uh, and that is a very prerogative question. Uh, how are authors, and you deal with them on a regular basis, you coach them. Yeah. Uh, how are authors going to beat AI? Yeah. And so when you coach people, when you look at their writing, when you try to make their writing better, more marketable, what have you, um, what do you tell them? You got to bring it to life now, Jay. The age of information and feel-good reading is done. It is the panda. And the panda, we know, is an animal on its way out. It's a, it's a dead-end species, right? So if you just think you're going to write and put out your book, you're, you're a panda. You're going to go the way of the dodo, go to the way of extinction. 
my programs are designed around those nonfiction authors that are, and you can do this with fiction um, because we see all these different communities that gather for conferences, that gather for different types of conventions. But for me with nonfiction and you too, it's the ability, can you take the words on your page and deliver them inside of a signature group coaching program? Deliver them inside of a masterclass. Deliver them as a consulting opportunity. And then finally, can you deliver it inside of an online course? That's where the author needs to be looking at. That's why I created the Author Launchpad is because I know that the successful author is not only going to use a great book, produce a great book with integrity. You could use the AI to look for misspellings and edits. But it's the author that shows up and moves themselves to the place of being a difference maker and learning how to shape behavior is the one that's really going to have that longevity, going to have that six figures, and is going to be able to really make a difference. For people. That's the takeaway that counts. But let me ask you, the difference between that, that's the ideal, that's what you would want all, all your coaching clients to, to accept and understand and live by. Yeah. But Suppose I went back to ChatGBT, um, and it would remember that I asked it for a 500-word story, yeah. and it gave me a 500-word story about a, a lighthouse keeper. Yeah. Um, and I said, look, I need a movie script of 90 minutes in length extending this story and bringing in the following elements, you know, romance, violence vengeance, all that stuff that we know sells, yeah. you know, on late night uh, cable TV. And it did, you know, I mean, this story could be written in about 90 seconds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What's the difference? And it would be marketable because, because we, we know by definition that it contains all the elements, all the pulp fiction elements that we see on cable, late night cable, all those movies, what, they're all, they're all reminiscent of each other. Um, so I say, here, include these elements and give me a 90-minute movie script uh, with this many characters and, and here are some points of the plot and you know, whatever it turns you on. <clears throat> and it does this. Now, what's the difference? Be and it does this in minutes. Yeah. And what's the difference between that and this carefully crafted statement of humanity that you are trying to achieve with your clientele? Yeah, very good. I'm going to take the end of your statement right there. It's, it's the humanity part again. <laughs> Not to say, you know, I, I've got how to win friends and influence people by Carnegie. That's a, a powerful humanity. It's how to connect with another person. So can you create that script from it? Sure you could, Jade, but it goes back to, again, are you just leaving people in the sphere of information, in the sphere of feel good? because? The poles are going to keep melting. The rainforests are going to keep burning. All of the challenges of humanity are going to keep happening because we love the experience of the feel good. And the challenge for human beings is to take action and stay consistent with it. That makes a difference. So if we're just interested in the feel goods, then yes, Jay, you've got a great movie. I'll buy tickets today. I'll go to the red carpet. But if you got a program, that is going to shape my life so I can make a difference in the world, I'll pay even more for that. There you go again, Chris. Chris Trammell tried to improve the human condition on our planet. There you go. And I agree with everything you said. Very valuable discussion. Thank you so much for coming on Think Tech and giving us these points of philosophical wisdom. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jay. And more power to all of your listeners, you're still real, which is great. Uh, but when you're ready to create that uh, course and not use AI, I want to be there with you on that one. There's much more to discuss. We'll circle back. We'll do this again. Awesome, Jake. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.